You could also use what we call an AWS Security Token Service or AWS STS. So what is AWS STS? It is a web service that enables you as a, to have an IAM user, federated user or application to assume an IAM role that they want. When you use the assume role operation for that as user or role of that AWS STS API, you will invoke that the API call from the STS and the web service returns to you the temporary limited privilege credentials that were requested by the IAM user or the user that was authenticated through federation. The example policy allows an IAM user to assume any role that is defined in AWS account number as long as the role name starts with, for example, test here in this slide. You can also have a role-based access control. You can consider two different approaches to access control, the role-based access control and attribute-based access control, and these are really important for the exam. In role-based access control, you use historically on-premises and in the cloud users. You want to grant explicit access with a set of pre-configured permission. So for example, if you have a database administrator, network administrator, and a developers, you have one or more network administrator who are also developers. You would not create a new policy to grant those permission. Instead, you can add those users to both roles. This approach is familiar and has many advantages. However, the problem is that the, por the person who maintains the permissions in this model might find it that they must consistently update the permissions files to add access to a certain role each time a new resources is created. Before you consider the second approach to permissions control, you should understand the tagging feature in AWS. AWS enables customers to assign a metadata to their AWS resources and identities in the form of tags. Each tag is a symbol label that consists of a customer-defined key and an optional value. Tags can make it easier to manage, search for, or even filter those resources. Tags have many practical uses. For example, you can create technical tags to identify that a resource is a web server, part of a specific project, part of a specific environment like testing, development, or production. You can also create business tags to identify the department or the cost center that this resource should be built to. You can also set security tags such as an, an identifier for a specific data confidentiality level that a resource supports. You can create up to tags per resources and these resources, each tag key must be unique and each tag key can have only one value. Tag keys and values are case sensitive. Now let us look to attribute-based access control. So we know now that we can tag the resources. So let us now understand how attribute-based access control will work. With attribute-based access control, you can use to create a general permissions rules that scale with your organization. And IAM users have attributes that you created and applied to, such as one or more tags. With resources also have an attributes like matching the tags that you also applied to the resources. In this approach, written permissions is very straightforward. The policy checks to see if an attribute that is applied to an IAM user is also applied to the resources that they want to access. When you create a new IAM users and a new account resources, you apply the correct tags to the users and to the resources. So this is an example of applying an attribute-based access policy to your organization. And the first step is to create an identity, such an IAM user or an IAM role. These identities must have the attributes that will be used for access control purposes. For example, you can apply the team developers and the project unicorn tag to the Maria user. Require attributes for new resources, you should create policies that enforce the rule. You could require that a project attribute and a team attribute are applied to any resources when it is created. 
Configure access permission based on the attributes. For example, say that an IAM user has the project equal unicorn and team equal developer tag. If that user trying to access a resource that has matching value for the same two tags, then the policy will allow the access. Otherwise, the policy will deny access. Test your configuration. For example, you could try to create an Amazon Aurora database instance without the required tag. In this case, the attempt should fail. Try creating a database instance again with the required tag and in this time, you should be able to create the resource successfully and you could try to access the database instance as the Maria user. Your access should succeed. Okay, so with externally authenticated user, you can use identity federation. Because AWS support identity federation for delegated access to the AWS management console or the API. Identity federation or external identities are granted secure access to the resources in your AWS account without needing to create an IAM user. There is four primary steps that are needed when you use an identity provider to create a temporary credential for a user or application. Identity federation can be accomplished in one of three ways. The first way is to use a corporate uh, Microsoft Active Directory, for example, or a custom identity broker application. In this case, each option of those will use AWS STS. The second approach is to create an integration that uses security assertion markup language, and this will be a third approach where you can use a web identity providers such as Amazon, Cognito, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, and so on. How you can accomplish identity federation using an identity broker? The process includes the following steps. A user access an application and the user enters their user ID and password and submit them. Then the identity broker receives the authentication request and then communicates with the corporate identity store which might be a Microsoft Active Directory or a lightweight directory like an LDAP server. If the authentication request is successful, the identity broker make a request to AWS STS. And this is why I told you guys, go and make sure to understand the STS and how it can give you a temporary security credentials to access the application. The user application receives those temporary AWS security credentials and redirects them to the AWS management console. The user did not need to sign in directly in AWS with a different set of credentials. Instead, the process only have a single sign-on implementation or SSO because we use a single sign-on and this single sign-on is recognized by the identity broker. The user application could also use the same temporary AWS security credentials to access the AWS services if the IAM policy document allow it. If you want to integrate it with security assertion markup language, then the process involving the following step. A user in your organization navigates to the, an internal portal in your network. The portal also functions as the IDP, the Identity Broker, which can handle the SMA, the SAML trust between your organization and AWS. The Identity Broker, in this case, authenticate the user against the Identity Store which might be an LDAP server or Microsoft Active Directory. The portal receives the authentication responses as an SAML assertion from the identity broker. The client posts the SML assertion on the AWS sign-in endpoint for SAML and the endpoint communicates with AWS STS and it invokes the assume role with SAML operation and normally they ask about this role and how exactly a third party with SAML open standard can exchange authentication and authorization data between an identity data broker and AWS services. In the last step, in step number five, the client received the temporary AWS security credentials and the client is redirected to the AWS management console and is also authenticated 
with the temporary AWS security credentials. Now you might be saying both identity federation using SAML and identity federation with an identity broker sound very complicated and very hard to implement. I can agree with you and the solution for that is Amazon Cognito. Amazon Cognito is a fully managed service. It's to provide us with authentication, authorization, and user management for both web and mobile application. Amazon Cognito provides us with web identity federation, and it can be used to as the identity broker that supports IDPs that are compatible with OpenID Connect, and they have a federated identities integration, so you can use identity provider like Amazon, Facebook, Google, or any third-party SAML. You create user pools. So the two main components of Amazon Cognitos are the user pool and the identity pool. A user pool, and this is very important for you guys to understand, a user pool is a user directory in Amazon Cognito. It will be in AWS. Users can sign in to a web or a mobile application using Amazon Cognito, and they can also federate through a third-party identity federation broker. And in this case, all members of the user pool have a directory profile that can be accessed through an SDK. Now, the identity pools enables the creation of a unique identities and a permissions assignments for those users. With an identity pool, users can obtain a temporary AWS credentials to access the AWS services or resources. Identity pools can communicate with Amazon Cognito user pools, social sign-in with Facebook, Google, and login with Amazon, and even you can use an open ID, which is an open source um, framework for authentication and authorization to connect to your application provider. So this is an example how you can employ Amazon Cognito. In this scenario, the goal is to authenticate a user using Amazon Cognito and then grant that user access to another AWS service. In the first step, the app user signs in through an Amazon Cognito user pool and after they have been successfully authenticated, receive user pool token. The app exchanges the user pool token for AWS credentials through an Amazon Cognito identity pool. And finally, the app user uses those credentials to access other AWS services.